How's it going guys, Chris here, and today we're going to be taking a look at all the different enemy types and bosses you'll encounter over the course of the Resident Evil 4 Remake, featuring lots of nasty looking monsters and creatures, all of which are out to give you a pretty rough time. So the very first and most common enemy type you'll come across is the Ganado, but more particularly, the village people. No, not the ones trying to get you to join the YMZA, but the ones trying to shove pitchforks into your face. The local villagers in the game have been practically brainwashed to follow a crazy neo-pagan religion, forming an army of mindless zombie-like humans which have been infected by the Plaga Parasite, influencing their actions and potentially mutating them at will. Despite basically being cannon fodder for their religious leader, Ganados can be extremely aggressive and very hostile to outsiders, having strict orders to kill trespassers on sight. The villagers are armed with a wide variety of farming tools and random things in the environment they can weaponize, staggering towards you while lunging with axes, pitchforks, scythes and lots of other stabby objects. It's generally best to try and keep your distance, with the Ganados having strength in numbers, often surrounding you and attempting to turn you into mincemeat as they lead you into a corner. Shooting them in the head and legs will cause them to stumble, allowing you to kick them all over the place and deal high damage, though it can often be best to sneak up behind them to take them down with your combat knife, if you fancy going down the stealthy route. Although most of the villagers will resort to short range melee attacks, some of them will attempt to attack over distance, using crossbows and by launching dangerous things in your direction. Axes being a pretty common thing to whiz past your head, but also makeshift Molotov cocktails and dynamite too, which can be far deadlier and trickier to avoid. Definitely a good idea to try and shoot those things first, before they have a chance to be sent through the air in your direction. Now you gotta remember that the Plaga Parasite is pretty much in charge of these humans, using their bodies as a host. Sometimes after fatally wounding a Ganado, this parasite will mutate to prevent death, popping out from their snap necks while giving the host heightened strength. These mutated variants have extra power and are able to withstand more damage, rushing at you and grabbing a hold to let that parasite do the nasty work. It's generally best to stab a mutating Ganado before it has a chance to transform, typically indicated by them shaking around on the floor after taking a bunch of damage, as these broken neck enhanced variants can definitely make situations more problematic, plus you've already technically killed them once before so having to do so again isn't really something you'll probably want to do, costing you more ammo and making a fight more complicated than it needs to be. One of Resident Evil 4's most iconic enemies is of course the Chainsaw Man, who a lot of the old school players will probably know as Dr. Salvador, one of the game's most relentless opponents. This guy is basically a really tall, beefed up Ganado with a burlap sack plopped over his head, armed with an extremely deadly blood soaked chainsaw, as the name might suggest. Definitely someone you'll want to keep your distance from, as if you get caught out by one of those lunges, well, that's the end of you, with his attacks generally always being a one hit kill. This makes him one of the most formidable enemies in the game, also one who's able to withstand a buttload of damage too. That chainsaw can be held up, acting like a bit of a shield to block incoming fire. Though just like with the standard villagers, aiming for the head and legs can often be a good way to slow him down, causing him to stagger while leaving him open to a melee strike. With that said, being someone that can slice you in half with one swift move, you'll probably want to get the hell away after doing so. With the combination of being a complete badass combined with wacky video game logic, you can always parry the chainsaw man's attacks with your knife if need be, which is a good way to prevent instant death, though also a good way to turn that knife into scrap metal. It'll probably save your life and make you look pretty cool, but in a tactical sense it shouldn't be relied on unless you really need it. Most of us can agree that wearing an animal head for a hat is a pretty barbaric thing to do, though it doesn't seem to phase the brutes, a new enemy type introduced for the remake, only one that's a bit beefed up, pardon the pun. In a similar way to the Chainsaw Man, these guys are tough, resilient and pack a nasty punch, not quite having the same one hit kill potential, but nevertheless still someone you'll probably want to stay clear from, having quite a lot of power and durability to your guns. Some of the brutes you'll encounter carry massive sledgehammers, which can give you a nasty whack, also extending the range of their attacks. To slam the hammer down and swing it around, which you're going to have to dodge to avoid taking a hefty amount of damage. Other brutes later on in the game carry automatic crossbows, capable of obliterating your health. It's typically best to hide behind cover when those bolts come flying, popping out to dish out the damage with your own weapons in between those firing cycles. Though to bide yourself some extra time, you could always shoot the crossbow itself to set the brute alight. Like other enemies, shooting the head and legs will slow them down, allowing you to kick them in the face. Though because of the greater threat they pose to a lot of the other enemies, it can often be best to prioritise taking care of the brutes first, using your stronger weapons and grenades to get rid of them with less fuss. 
Humans definitely aren't the only thing getting infected by that plague and parasite, with some of the local wildlife also being consumed by it too. You'll sometimes run into packs of freaky looking wolves which have gobs full of dagger-like teeth. These are the colmios, blagger infested wolves that hunt you down in groups, circling around striking from unexpected positions while using speed and agility to their advantage. These things are sure to put your situational awareness to the test, as you'll need to watch your back and focus on multiple enemies at once. They often like to use rush and retreat tactics, sneaking up behind to bite you in the arse, and use the element of surprise to get the drop on you as they surround the nearby area, even known to jump into bushes to flee after one of their hit and run attacks. Those swift movements can make them awkward buggers to hit at times, though they don't take all that much damage to bring down, with most normal weapons being fine enough to get the job done, taking care of them one by one. Though if you're having trouble landing those hits, you can always whip out the trusty shotgun to make short work of them in no time with that wider spread of pellets, ensuring more shots are going to land bang on target. The first main boss you'll encounter comes in the form of a gigantic mutant salamander known as Del Lago. Although you won't really be able to see much of this monster, spending most of its time submerged under the water in the village lake, you will need to take it on in a fight, in order to cross that lake safely in your little wooden boat. The parasite that caused the creature to become so bloody big also gives it an aggressive and unpredictable nature, hence why it was sealed off in the lake in the first place, as a sort of discarded experiment. The fight begins when your boat's anchor gets snagged to the beast as it jumps up to try and swallow you whole, dragging you along for the ride, forcing you to swerve debris in the lake along with its own deadly attacks. Thankfully for you, whoever left that motorboat behind for you to use also left an infinite supply of harpoons too, which will come in handy for skewering the monster as it pulls you behind. Although it does look like you're just giving the creature acupuncture, be assured that these harpoons will, slowly but surely, wear the creature down, to the point where it'll get pretty fed up if you lob in them, forcing it to detach and submerge under the murky water. You'll need to keep your eye out for it resurfacing and charging at you with that massive mouth wide open, giving you a good opportunity to throw a harpoon down its gullet, dishing out high damage while preventing it from barging into your boat. Del Lago will keep switching up its attacks to make the fight less predictable, attempting to batter your boat while it gets peppered by your harpoons. Though after dodging enough of those attacks and breaches while you slowly turn it into a pincushion, the creature will eventually succumb to its wounds and sink to the bottom of the lake, allowing you to continue with the mission at hand. Over the course of the Plaga's life cycle, the parasite can mature, mutating into different forms, often while still being in control of their host. One of the earliest stages of this evolution is the Guadagna, often referred to as Plaga Type A, typically replacing their host's head and waving around their side flight tentacles to overcome a threat, which in this case is basically you. Some of the Ganados you'll encounter will be unfortunate enough to go through this process, with this horrific mutation often being triggered after they've taken damage, with the parasite using this as a sort of defense mechanism, exposing itself to try and take you on. Obviously, you don't really want to get too close to these guys, as those fleshy tentacles violently swinging around from where that Ganado's head used to be will give you a pretty nasty whack. They're not exactly very tough at this stage, only taking a few shots to kill, but still something you'll want to take care of earlier rather than later, though a good way to do so is by using flash grenades, with the parasite being extremely sensitive to bright lights. This Guadagna mutation can also occur in some of the wolves you'll run into as well, with those tentacles sprouting upwards erupting from their backs, lashing out if you get too close. Because the wolves are more nimble than the human hosts, this can make their attacks even more effective, being able to close the gap quicker while combining pounce attacks with the Plaga's arm jabs to make them even trickier enemies to fight. One of the biggest enemies you'll face is El Gigante, a human that mutated to an extremely large size being the subject of Plaga testing. In a similar way to Del Lago, essentially being a scientific experiment, this guy also showed increased hostility and aggression towards pretty much anything it encountered. So although it could be seen as an effective bioweapon, those anger management issues were a little bit hard to keep under control, resulting in El Gigante test subjects to be locked away where they couldn't create any more havoc. Well, that's until one manages to break free, with a little help from a Ganado, just as you're passing through the area it's being contained. And with no way of escaping the monster, it's up to you to take it on in a fight. This giant mutant's got all the characteristics you'd expect it to have, from boosted strength, durability and power, able to shrug off bullets like the hailstones and crush you into the ground with overhead smashes and stomps. Aside from keeping your distance to avoid getting smushed into the floor, you'll also need to be aware of him lobbing boulders and debris at you, along with his charge attacks too, which not only knock off large chunks of health, but also allow him to get closer within a much more dangerous distance. 
Being such a big bloke, it's not exactly difficult to land shots on target, though it's probably best to keep your weapons aimed high and blast away at his face to cause the most pain. Weapons like shotguns, grenades and flashbangs are all going to help here to dish out more damage quickly, and whenever the big guy staggers, it's a good idea to slash away at the parasite popping out from his back, acting as a bit of a weak spot. If you chose to save the dog earlier on in the game, then he'll come back here to return the favour. If you didn't save him, then shame on you. Although the dog mainly just acts as a distraction most of the time, he's still a good boy nevertheless, diverting attention away from yourself, allowing you to flank the giant to deal damage on that parasitic weak spot. And once enough damage is dealt over time, you'll be able to put an end to that stompy rampage, letting you move on to the next area in one piece. Now if the Chainsaw Man wasn't hazardous enough, wait until you get boxed into a small room with the Chainsaw Sisters, who use similar attacks to their counterpart, only giving you a lot less breathing room, with you now having two of these psychos to deal with and practically nowhere to run or hide. How exciting. With their heads wrapped up in bandages, the Chainsaw Sisters are pretty damn brutal. They're able to withstand loads of damage and of course deal loads of damage, with practically all of their attacks being fatal, ending your life at any moment with just one grisly lunge. Just like with the Chainsaw Man, keeping your distance is obviously going to be a no-brainer here, though because you've got two extremely powerful enemies to contend with at once, while having to dance around a bunch of infected Ganado flooding the room as well, it's definitely a fight that's going to keep you on your toes, having lots of things to worry about as you try your best to survive. Getting that knife out and parrying those attacks can prove to be useful if you get yourself cornered or need to avoid getting insta-killed, though it's generally best to utilise your high-powered weapons and throwables to give you an edge and prevent you from being overwhelmed also allowing you to deal high damage melee attacks as you focus on taking down each sister one after the other. One of the main bad guys you'll have to deal with earlier on in the game is the Village Chief, an ex-Catholic priest who became influenced by the Los Illuminados cult, now willing to do his leader's bidding at any cost, whether that be to convert the villagers or carry out specific tasks. Unlike the average Ganado who staggers around in a zombified state, Mendes has been infected by a dominant species plaga a genetically engineered variant which gives him full control of his actions, thoughts and speech, along with superhuman strength and resistance to pain. Oh, and the ability to mutate into a horrific monstrosity at any given time, should he choose to do so. Of course, he does choose to do so, and there's no better place to do so than in the slaughterhouse, where you'll have a bit of a boss fight as Mendes assumes a much more twisted form, with his body breaking up and growing huge bug-like claws, elongated nails, and an overall much more menacing appearance looking a little bit like a demon centipede, with a beard. Now having a lot more height and a longer reach, you'll have to duck and dodge your swipes and stabs, doing your best to keep some distance, while shooting away with all the firepower you've got to whittle down his health. Though it can often be a good idea to clamber up one of the ladders in the room to reach a higher vantage point, attacking from an elevated level to shoot an eye found on his hunched over back, dishing out extra damage with it acting as a weak spot. Despite seeming almost invincible, your weapons and grenades will eventually be enough to split Mendes in half, clearing the first phase of the fight. He'll assume a new form, sort of looking a bit like Scorpion King, only without the rock's face and with better CGI, and then climb up to the rafters to throw fiery planks in your direction, which you'll need to evade, along with the explosive canisters, which you'll want to shoot, not only to blow him up, but also avoid taking a massive amount of damage. He'll keep swinging down to lash out of you with melee attacks and retreating high up to lob things at you over distance. They'll keep the damage flowing and you'll eventually be able to win the fight, knocking Mendes to the floor, thus finishing him off for good. Along with the villagers, the many monks and workers living within Salazar's castle have also been victims of the Plague of Parasite, becoming an army of cultists ordered to defend the castle against intruders. These zealot ganados act in a fairly similar way, wandering towards you while brandishing weapons, only these guys have got access to the castle's medieval armoury, now carrying extended scythes, axes and spike maces, crossbows and even shields, which will need to be destroyed and flanked around if you want to hit the guy hiding behind. When in doubt, get the shotgun out. They might be using slightly different tools and now look a bit like Darth Sidious, but the way these zealots behave is very similar to the villagers, having a variety of close and longer ranged attacks, only with a few new curveballs thrown in the mix. With you now not only having those shields to contend with, but also metal masks and helmets, helping to block some of your bullets, thus taking a few hits to actually remove. For this reason, headshots aren't always going to be effective as they were before, so you'll need to adjust your aim to deal with specific targets, paying attention to what they're wearing, perhaps choosing to fire at their legs more often in closer ranges to stagger them, letting you close in and pretend you're in a wrestling ring. Being the most common enemy type in the castle, the Ganado Zealots will surround you, attacking various waves and often drive you into a corner, forcing you to plan your next move. 
though being infected by the parasite they worship, this opens them up to mutation. And let's just say a pretty wild one at that. The next phase of a Plaga parasite's life cycle is the Mandibula, aka Plaga Type B, which violently erupts from a Ganado's head, completely obliterating it in the process, only to harbour a huge worm-like creature which hangs out of the human's neck, complete with spiky legs and a gaping jaw, containing hundreds of barbed teeth. This Type B parasite has matured enough to ditch those scythe tentacles in exchange for a massive mouth. Though aside from looking like something that should be terrorising the town of Hawkins, its standard function is somewhat similar to before only now being a lot more dangerous and resilient, also having a few fancy tricks up its sleeve to try and catch you off guard. The Mandibula can jump up and latch onto the ceiling, only to then drop down on you from above, which you're going to have to dodge of course. It's also known to spit acid over distance to deal with attackers outside of its reach, and if you let the bloody thing get too close, well it's probably not going to end very well for you, with your head potentially becoming worm food. You can counter its short range lunges with your knife, perhaps saving your skin in a sticky situation, though shooting at the mouth is generally going to be a good idea, with that being the parasite's main weak spot. Flash grenades are going to come in very handy, with the bright lights being the parasite's biggest weakness, able to practically kill them instantly. Though it's key to know that some of the elite zealots wearing the red robes have mastered the ability to blur your vision and forcefully summon these parasites out of nearby ganados, and themselves, potentially filling the room with lots of these tough insta-kill enemies all at once so it's advisable to gun him down first if you want to make your fights a little less problematic. Easily one of the most dread-inducing enemies you'll try your best not to bump into is the Garador, one of Resident Evil 4's most devastating opponents. Garadors are essentially experimental super soldiers, granted exceptional strength from Plaga testing, though just like most of the other experiments, an uncontrollably violent nature too. Some have been chained up as a way of keeping them contained, and fortunately for you, they've also got their eyes sewn shut, so at least they can't see you coming. Though unfortunately for you, this means that they've also developed extra sensitive hearing, and because they've got a pair of gigantic razor sharp claws strapped to their arms, combined with that extreme heightened sense of aggression, any noise made will attract their attention, resulting in them rushing over to brutally butcher whatever made that noise, by slashing the living crap out of it. This means you've got to be very careful as you navigate around a Garador, strategically dodging things that can make noise, like hanging chains, while keeping your movement slow and steady and knowing the right time to pull the trigger. These guys are definitely good at amping up the tension, especially with them being so resistant to your guns, which most of the time just winds them up even more and gives away your position, unless you're using that stealthy bolt thrower of course. Garadors aren't particularly bothered about who they slice up, so they can actually be somewhat helpful, slaughtering other enemies in the area if you lead them in their direction, which can be done by shooting your weapons and other things in the environment, such as bells. As soon as they come charging though, you'll need to get the hell out of there, but Garadors aren't invincible despite their resistance to bullets, as if you creep around them, you'll find a parasite popping out of their backs, which acts as a weak spot, and dealing enough damage to this will put a stop to their onslaught, letting you finally breathe a sigh of relief. What's worse than a giant mutating monster? Well, a giant mutating monster wearing a butt ton of heavy armour. As it turns out, there's more of these huge test subjects in the area, with one of them being released and given impenetrable metal plating. Conventional weapons are practically useless against this El Gigante, so the only thing that you can do at this moment is dodge his attacks. Thankfully for you, this guy isn't in a position to get within melee range, though he's still pretty good at launching rocks and debris through the air, which you'll desperately need to avoid as you move along the castle rampart and find a way to match his power. You're therefore going to have to climb one of the towers and lift up one of the cannons to the top which you can then use against the giant and blast him away with a well-placed shot, dealing significant damage and temporarily putting him out of action. It's not the end for this guy, as you're sure to see him again later on, but at least for now he's not going to be causing you any more problems. Once the Plaga Parasite has matured enough within its host, it can emerge from them in a different, much more independent form, a huge spider-like creature which scatters around, able to take control of new hosts which it does by simply jumping up and latching onto a Ganado, linking itself while getting a piggyback ride. This Type C Aranya variant acts more like its own individual enemy type, rather than being literally tied to a specific host, like with earlier Plaga mutations. And although it can use its own attacks against you, diving over to give you a nasty bite, it generally prefers to enhance other nearby Ganados instead, to give the Parasite a better chance of survival, with these creepy but defenseless things being fairly weak on their own, able to be gunned down in just a few shots. Grabbing a hold of a nearby human host not only allows it to weaponize that human, drastically boosting their aggression and speed, 
but it also provides the parasite with a human shield too, with the host taking most of the incoming flak rather than the sneaky spider clinging on from behind. It's therefore a good idea to shoot them before they get a chance to latch onto a body, as they can just keep hijacking different enemies until they're put down for good, which can really alter the pace of your gunfight, forcing you to move and think fast. Seems a decent portion of the game revolves around a big spooky medieval castle, you're sure to find a lot of empty armoured suits standing around the halls and corridors, though as it turns out, some of these suits aren't quite as dormant as they might first appear, actually being inhabited and basically possessed by Plaga Type A which doesn't currently have a human host to infect. These are the Armadoras, plaga-filled suits of armour which are controlled by tentacles, becoming active once a new host is around, replicating human movements as accurately as it can. Might look like it's had a few too many beers, but at least it's trying. To complete the package and make the parasite a proper knight in shining armour, the Armadora also typically wields a heavy sword to slice you up with, swinging it around as it staggers over within striking range, giving you a pretty good reason to stand back unless you want to get your head lobbed off. Speaking of heads coming off, you might notice the parasite peeping out from the neck of the suit, allowing it to see where it's going. So you want to shoot the Armadora's helmet off to expose the parasite, causing it to shoot up like it does when it affects some of the other Ganados, which can then be shot out to deliver damage, with your bullets just pinging off the metal suit doing no harm. Gotta remember that bright lights are one of the Plaga's main weaknesses, so blue lanterns and fire will cause it to retreat back into the suit, halting its movements, giving you a short window to attack or escape. Though once the plaga gets exposed and starts waving at you, flashbangs are once again a nice easy way to finish them off quickly, which can help you deal with multiple armadoras all at the same time. Another horrible experiment gone wrong comes in the form of the Novista door, giant bug-like creatures which were made from human and insect genes being fused together. They take the form of huge beetle-looking things which typically fly and crawl around, attacking from both the ground and the air by swiping their claws or pouncing on you and spitting corrosive bile all over your face. Some of them could even swim and hunt you down from under the water, so these guys can be pretty versatile when it comes to attacking from different places, and they often like to do so together, surrounding you from different angles, forcing you to keep an eye on what's around. The Nivista door creatures are highly vulnerable to gunfire, so despite sometimes being awkward to hit due to their unpredictable movements, at least it's not going to take too many shots to bring them crashing down, only to explode into a pile of mushy goo. Of course, there is strength in numbers, so you'll need to whittle down their numbers quickly before a whole swarm of them flood the screen. And they also have the devious little trick of being able to blend into their environment too, waiting for their prey to come wandering by as their skin acts as camouflage. If you can spot them, then they're basically a sitting duck, and in the areas where there's quite a lot of Navista doors around, it's often best to tread carefully, observing the path ahead before you go charging through it, like a dope. If you've ever wondered what you'd get if you cross a stag beetle with a xenomorph, and then made it ten times freakier, then you'd probably wind up getting something that looks a little bit like this guy. The Verdugo is another mutated DNA mashup using human and insect genes spliced together, controlled by Plaga, and ordered to serve as Salazar's bodyguards. The Verdugo is an ideal fit for the job, towering over the average human while being equipped with huge claws, long barbed tail, superhuman strength, and a bullet-resistant outer shell all things that are going to cause you a big problem when it eventually tries to hunt you down. As you creep around the castle sewers, the Verdugo is going to be on your case, persistently stalking you and jumping out to attack unexpectedly, dashing over to take you on up close. Failing that, it'll probably be hiding under the floor or in the ceiling, whipping out with its tail to deal damage from the shadows, and by combining both styles of attack, puts you in a pretty intense situation, having to be prepared to either dodge or run. Although you can take the coward's way out and just bolt it to the lift to escape, if you want to take the Verdugo on properly, it's best to utilise the nitrogen pipes dotted around the hallways, which can be activated to freeze the monster in place and weaken its shell, allowing you to inflict more damage with your guns and slowly whittle down its health. With that said, the Verdugo sure does take a beating, so it's definitely advisable to put those shotguns, revolvers and grenades to good use, as if you want to win this fight, you're going to have to be patient, determined and prepared to use up a fair bit of ammo. If you just can't get enough of El Giganti, well you'll be happy to see two of them pop up again a little bit later on in the game, one that's fairly similar to the first guy you encountered back in the village, and the other being that armoured one you blasted away with the cannon, who's back for a bit of revenge. You can expect this fight to play out like before, only now having two stompy giants to deal with at once, though instead of a dog running around and acting as a distraction, you've now got Louise to take some of the flak as well. The giant without all the armour should be the main priority at the start, running down his health with your weapons, shooting the head and slashing away at that exposed parasite popping out from his back. Once that guy's out for the count, 
You can then switch over to the other one with all the armour, firing at his face to slow him down while doing your best to avoid his heavy attacks. It's going to take a lot of bloody firepower to punt through that armour, but thankfully Luis will eventually get hold of some dynamite, which he'll attach to the big guy, giving you a nice target to shoot. If you can time it right, you can ignite said dynamite while the giant's standing over the huge trapdoor in the centre of the room, forcing him to snagger over and letting you then open the door and cause him to plummet down towards the lava pit below. And that's the end of that dude. One of the main bad guys of Resident Evil 4 is Ramon Salazar, a creepy little dude that basically owns the castle down to the family inheritance. Leaving the Catholic faith behind and converted to follow the Los Illuminados cult, Salazar's position in the area, combined with his impression ability, allowed the cult's leader, Osman Sadler, to essentially use Salazar for his own personal gain. Having so much influence and power within the region, this would make Sadler's goal of spreading his cult, along with the Plaga infection, a much easier thing to do with Salazar as a follower, who has been granted two Verdugo bodyguards and a dominant species Plaga, which gives Salazar full control of the parasite in his body, until of course he decides to unleash it. After getting shot in the face and thrown backwards off a ledge, Salazar decides to let that mutation take place. Probably not a bad time to do so either, with the Plaga keeping him alive, though turning him into a menacing plant-like monstrosity in the process. Of course, it's now your job to fight this monstrosity and put an end to Salazar for good. He's a very mobile target, able to climb around the room quickly due to his tendril-like appendages, and he'll use a variety of different close and long-range attacks, spitting black acid at you from a distance, dropping goo deposits on the floor which kind of act like proximity mines, along with closing in for a close quarter jump with that massive mouth of spiky teeth. You need to dodge and run away from these attacks, using cover to avoid getting melted by that acid, all while shooting at the now deformed Salazar, chilling out inside the creature's mouth. I'd advise using your high damage weapons on him whenever he decides to stop moving around, as this will cause him to flop down to the floor, letting you rush in to stab an eye found on the side of his head. You'll have to repeat this process a few times, but Salazar won't be able to withstand getting knifed in that head eye over and over, eventually dying from his wounds letting you move on to the next area safe and sound. A little bit later on in the game when you arrive at the island, you'll now be faced with a different type of Ganado, combat ready soldiers willing to defend their profit with a variety of modern weapons and tools. Although quite a lot of them carry basic melee weapons like fire axes, crowbars and spike clubs, some of them also have stun rods which can't be parried or blocked, temporarily paralysing you if you try, leaving you open to other attacks from nearby enemies. Other Ganados carry metal shields too, which unlike the wooden ones are going to stop your bullets from punching through, forcing you to either shoot the feet or try and find a way to flank around to deal damage from the sides. Just like the others, a lot of these Ganados can also mutate too, spicing up those fights even more with all the different types of Plaga emerging from them. And just when you thought they couldn't get any more dangerous, some of these soldiers also carry RPGs, which can fire rockets at you over long distances, dealing lots of damage if you get hit. Not to mention the guys that also like to gun you down using stationary gun emplacements too, which you'll definitely want to avoid to prevent being shredded up by those high calibre bullets. So the next enemy in the list is one of the most disturbing monsters in the whole Resident Evil series. The Regenerador is nothing short of nightmare fuel, an experimental byproduct creature formed in the labs, kept in cold storage while they hibernate. Well, most of them at least. Some of these creatures have woken up and will make it their mission to try and eat you alive. The tall, pale, flabby monsters with stretchy limbs and a jaw full of protruding teeth, stumbling around the dark corridors, pacing around in a clumsy, wobbly, unnatural way. Something to make these guys even creepier is the fact that they can regenerate shot off limbs and body parts too, which basically makes them unkillable by conventional methods, with gunfire mainly just slowing them down, allowing them to hunt you down relentlessly, unless you attack the specific parasites hidden within their bodies. Blasting the legs off can often be a bad idea with Regenerador's able to slither around on the floor and pounce on you to pin you down, something they also like to do after you've taken out some of their parasites, possibly to make that last one a little bit trickier to hit as they wiggle around on the floor. You'll have a much easier time taking these guys on once you get access to the biosensor scope, highlighting those parasites plus giving you an actual target to shoot at to bring them down, and hitting all of these parasites will kill the creature, causing it to explode in a shower of mushy goo. Lovely. Just when you thought Regenerators couldn't get any worse, well they can, as some of them have the ability to mutate into an even deadlier form after you've eliminated all of their parasites. This advanced form is known as the Iron Maiden, which is basically the monster equivalent to a cactus, a creature covered in head to toe with hundreds of huge spikes able to turn you into a pincushion if you get too close. 
It's got similar characteristics and attached to the Regenerators, though now has the ability to extend those spikes and damage you nearby. Though just like before, you can deal with these guys in the same way as their counterparts, aiming for those parasites which are typically found in their head, killing the Iron Maiden for good when destroyed. As one last ditch effort to try and take you down with it, the Iron Maiden is going to explode, shooting those needles all over the place, forcing you to dash off to some nearby cover. It'll be a good idea to run to the hills when it decides to do so, as you'll have to be quick or be dead when these killers send those spikes flying, giving you yet another reason to have a fear of the dark. So another one of the main bosses you'll have to fight a couple of times in the game is Jack Krauser, an experienced soldier who worked with Leon in the past, now believing the Plaga infection to be a source of strength and power. After obtaining a dominant species Plaga, this gave him heightened strength, speed and agility, which you'll see the first time you encounter Krauser and are put it together in a knife fight. Here you'll need to parry and dodge incoming blade attacks while slicing away at Krauser with your own to slowly chip away his health. It's best not to go too wild with your knife, as you'll leave yourself open more to getting slashed up, and it's best to try and read Krauser's movements and predict when he's going to strike, being prepared for him to jump over your head only to land behind for a sneaky stab in the back. After enough damage is dealt and you've survived long enough, the fight will be over, only for Krauser to return later on in the game after leading you through a maze full of traps and obstacles. You'll have to navigate through the island ruins, avoiding melee attacks and gunfire from Krauser, along with the explosive trip wires and gun cameras he's kindly left behind for you to run into. Whenever he starts to fire bullets and crossbow shots, you've also got a window to return the fire too, dealing heavy damage with the weapons you've got. Though the fight certainly isn't over just yet, as you'll have one last showdown as you reach the end of the ruins, only this time he lets the Plaga inside mutate, throwing his arms, transforming them into huge deadly blade-like claws. This is where the real fight begins, with those arms not only acting as weapons, but also acting as shields too, having bulletproof properties. He'll throw everything he's got at you in this fight, rushing forwards while waving those arms around to attack you in close range, and you'll therefore have to run around and evade those strikes, all while trying to shoot back to chip away at that health. It's generally best to utilise the ladders around the arena, switching positions and making you a harder target to hit, constantly dodging and countering attacks while popping off the odd shot here and there whenever he leaves himself vulnerable. Just keep dishing out the damage and avoiding his attacks, and he'll eventually win the fight, putting Krauser down for good. So the leader of the cult, Osman Sadler, is the big bad guy you'll have to face at the end of your journey, a bioweapons research chief who's pretty much the source of the region's mind-controlling plague problems, which he plans to use to expand his influence all across the world. Sadler has the ability to control the parasites within him and other hosts, so even in his human form, the guy's still got a hell of a lot of power, also able to withstand normal gunfire with the Plaga regenerating tissue and allowing him to pretty much soak up your bullets. At the very end of your journey, he gets a bit triggered by you shooting at him, causing Sadler to mutate into a gigantic nasty looking bug creature, with the parasite inside forcing its way out of his body, heavily morphing Sadler in the process. To put an end to the Prophet's devious master plan, you'll need to squash this bug for good, which is easier said than done with the creature being the size of a house. It'll attempt to crush you into the floor and wave around its bone-plated arms, attacking with a variety of short-range lunges and strikes, all of which you'll need to duck and dodge to avoid taking a hefty smack. Sadler also likes to try and take you on from a distance too, spraying loads of acidic liquid in your direction which you'll need to step out of the way of. It's best to stay on the move at all times, retreating to a safer distance away from those slams, all while blasting away at the multiple eyes that have appeared all over his legs and body. These act as weak spots, which, once you pop like giant spots, forces Sadler to drop down to the ground, letting you close in to stab him in that main eye found in his mouth. You'll have to do this several times, or while he destroys pathways around the arena, making it smaller, thus giving you less routes to escape. Shoot his army of Navistadors that come to assist, while using explosive barrels to aid in the fight, and eventually you'll pop enough of Sadler's eyes to take him down, where he'll plummet off the side of the platform to his death. Okay, maybe not as he's still clinging on to dear life, now wrapping the entire area up with parasitic tentacles. Just great. He used said tentacles to enclose you into a small space and slam down on you to try and finish you off. Just keep shooting the orange or black shield, protecting Sadler, preferably with some of your heavier weapons like the revolvers and rifles, and you'll eventually be thrown a lifeline. Literally. Ada will chuck an RPG over in front of your feet, which you can then use to blast Sadler's shield away, letting Leon run over to finish the fight once and for all stabbing away at that mouth eye one last time, destroying Sadler and his twisted parasite for good. So those are all the main enemy types and bosses you can expect to find over the course of Resident Evil 4's main story, 
Thanks for watching guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Hit that like button on the way out if you did, and subscribe to see more guides just like this on my channel. Take it easy folks, and I'll be seeing you in that next one. Where's everyone going? Bingo?